Welcome back everyone, it's me again Matt, appreciate you being on today's video. Drones, talked about them so many times on my channel, but this is one that you've probably been quite familiar with in the past, the Reaper. And some people get quite confused with the Reaper and the Predator and all the different variants of UAVs that the United States have, so I thought I'd do a bit of a video discussing about the most modern and up-to-date variant that they have today. Quick reminder for everyone though, before we get started, if you do want to be notified of any upcoming videos from my channel or you are new to my channel, I would encourage you to click the subscribe button and the little bell button so you can be notified of when I release new content. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the MQ-9 Reaper, otherwise known as the Reaper MQ-9 Alpha. The Reaper is a remotely piloted, medium-altitude, long-endurance aircraft designed for intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance, otherwise known as ISTAR, and certain attack missions. The MQ-9 Reaper represents the cutted edge of unmanned aerial vehicle technology, but the idea of using unmanned entities of waging war in the air isn't really new. Interesting story for you. In the early days of the United States' involvement in World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt approved research into a plan to release bomb-wielding bats from airplanes. The bombs, which were small, kerosene-filled incendiary tubes that operated on a chemical time-release fuse, were connected to a surgical clip with a short piece of string, and the clip was attached to a bat's chest. The idea was to cool the bats down into a state of forced hibernation, initiate the chemical fuse, attach the device, load the placid bats onto a plane, and then release them over a target area. Ideally, the bats would seek shelter in buildings, chew through the string, separate themselves from the devices, and then the device would detonate, setting the enemy infrastructure on fire. What actually happened was a bunch of hibernating bomb-laden bats be given drops into their death from an airplane. 6,000 bomb rig bats gave their lives in these military experiments. Fast forward to today and we have much more sophisticated systems, but it did give some lessons learnt. To talk about the MQ-9 Reaper, we must talk about its predecessor, the MQ-1 Predator, which was designed and produced by General Atomics, which rolled out in August 1994. Production of a 100 horsepower version of the United States Air Force and US Navy variants was ordered in 1997 after a handful of pre-production aircraft have been deployed for service over Bosnia in 1996. By summer 2001, successful trials of the AGM-114 Hellfire and onboard targeting systems were complete, and the Predator had fired missiles in anger against targets in Afghanistan before year end. While the MQ was being weaponized, General Atomics was working on a new UAV designed the Predator B. The title was in fact a Masoma, since the aircraft bore little in common with the MQ-1 apart from its general configuration. Predator B featured a 900 shaft horsepower TPE-331 turboprop and was designed for a heavy payload of sensors and weapons. The United States Air Force committed to the Predator B program under the designation of the MQ-9 Reaper. Work on the prototypes was well underway in 2001, and the type became available for operations in 2007. Many discussions came to be about replacing A-10s and other close air support vehicles with UAVs in general, but of course this was a completely ridiculous stance because drones can't do everything. Now one of the things that was noticed, aside from the quick ambush of unsuspecting targets, was that predators don't pack much of a punch. So the MQ-9 Reaper, which was designed to address this issue, was actually a more capable aircraft of engaging for longer periods of time and further targets, which, of course, the Predator did not have that capability. The Reaper was more of a hunter-killer with surveillance capabilities and was more designated as an engagement vehicle than it was in a surveillance vehicle, especially during the times of Iraq and Afghanistan. 
The 140 mile per hour or 225 km per hour speed of the Predator was suitable for hovering back and forth in the sky searching for troop movements and giving the coordinates to nearby fighter jets. However, the 300 mile per hour or 482 km per hour speed of the Reaper, on the other hand, is better suited for quickly targeting and destroying enemy personnel and vehicles that are on the move. The Reaper can fly about 9 times farther and twice as high as the Predator and doesn't require as many fighter jets for backup. It's proved its muscle time and time again throughout all operational conflicts that it's been involved in. One important thing to remember about the Reaper, and the Predator as well, is that the Reaper is a weapon system, not just an individual drone which you see in the sky. Each Reaper system consists of four individual Reaper drones operated by four different flight teams. The whole system alone costs around $45 million just to build, let alone the infrastructure. So it's an extremely expensive program, which is why a lot of people say that it is actually cheaper to use aircraft with pilots in than it is drones, and the cost of value to life is where we start getting complex, and we're not going to talk about that today. The Reapers are deployed in groups of four. Each Reaper, which is similar in size to a small business jet, is controlled by its own two airmen, which are a team located in ground control stations around the world. The teams are actually able to switch control of the drone mid-flight, so a team at an airbase in Iraq may be responsible for takeoffs and landings from its base, but then hand over control to a team in the United States. Why would they do this, you ask? Well, remember that the operation of these UAVs are in motion 24 hours a day. It's more efficient to have some teams dedicated to getting them airborne and bringing them back down safely, and others dedicated to fulfilling specific missions. This way, there are fewer teams overseas landing drones all day and more teams based in the United States who are responsible for the Reaper during the duration of its mission, which lasts normally about a full 24-hour day. A crew responsible for takeoffs and landings may have absolutely no idea where the aircraft has been in the interim period. The crews receive visual information about the Reaper's surroundings by way of a satellite link. The pilot is able to fly the craft using a coloured feed provided by the camera located in the front portion of the Reaper. What's more, the Reaper can transmit surveillance footage directly onto a soldier's laptop in the field if necessary. A variety of sensors on board the Reaper provide real-time data for operators to analyse. The Reaper has infrared capabilities and can provide colour video images during daylight flights or image intensified video at night. Various imaging capabilities can also be viewed separately or video streams can be fused. The Reaper's data collection equipment sends back live feeds, enabling military and government officials to react immediately to ongoing developments or rapidly changing situations. This is why the Reaper is very, very accustomed to doing very long distance patrols or standoff patrolling, which allows these aircraft to fly for long periods of time, keeping a eye in the sky or combat capability in the sky a lot longer than that would be of a fighter aircraft. The crew itself comprises of a pilot, sensor operator and mission intelligence coordinator which flies the Reaper from a remote ground control system. The operational crew controls the aircraft, its sensors and weapon systems via the advanced secure satellite communication system providing the over horizon data link capability from bases across the world. The two cameras in the aircraft's forward fuselage provide the forward view for the crew of the landing and takeoff while a full sensor suite with targeting daylight TV and infrared capabilities is a turret mounted beneath the Reaper's forward fuselage. An internal synthetic aperture radar completes the MQ-9 sensor suite. The Reaper can be outfitted with different mission kits, depending on what mission it will be. For instance, it could be equipped with a mix of weapons and surveillance equipment, depending on whether it's a mission to destroy or to actually secretly locate locations of enemy. On the other hand, it can be armed with four or even potentially eight Hellfire missiles which recently just got released from the United States National Defense, saying that they are able to carry just as much as an actual fighter aircraft in terms of Hellfire missiles, which is pretty impressive. We look at the A-10 and they can pack a lot of equipment on that thing. It looks like the Reaper's starting to catch up. The dual purpose of the Reaper is best understood when it's compared to the Predator in action. In June 2006, a predator tracked and located Aboub Sabul al saqi which is the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. However, the Predator flight crew had to request assistance from the mission for the F-16s because the Predator didn't have enough explosive ordnance to destroy the safe house where he was hiding. It turned out that the Al-Qaeda leader was killed by the F-16, but the delay could have allowed him to make the getaway. With this type of scenario in mind, the Reaper was designated to eliminate any delay in tracking the target, striking it, and it can do just about everything in between. The UAV's original purpose was reconnaissance, and although its design has shifted to reflect the emphasis on attack, Reapers are adept at high flight spying. This ability can be put to use in several ways. As I said before, there is a lot of capability for ice style with this aircraft, but also in terms of air-to-air -air engagements. 
there was a report of a UAV being able to actually engage an air asset, which is something that, you know, Reaper drones and Predator drones would never ever ask to do. But these aircraft can be given the sensors, radar and technology to actually launch air to air missiles. The Reaper is being used in battle zones and manhunts in both Iraq and Afghanistan today. The use of the weapon systems could be more widespread than that, but because Reaper's missions are carried out completely covertly, we can't really be sure. The aircraft is powered by a 950 horsepower turboprop aircraft with a maximum speed of 260 knots or 480 kilometers or 300 miles per hour, and a cruiser speed of around 200 miles per hour or 310 kilometers an hour. It has a 66 foot wingspan and a maximum payload of 3,800 pounds or 1,700 kilograms and can be armed with a variety of weaponry including obviously the Hellfire missiles and laser guided bomb units. The endurance of the aircraft is 30 hours when conducting ISR missions which decreases to 23 hours if it's carrying a full load of weapons. The Reaper has an extortionate range of 1,000 nautical miles or 1,850 kilometers, and an operational altitude of 50,000 feet or 15,000 meters, which makes it especially useful for long-term loitering operations both for surveillance and support of ground troops. But what is the future for this beautiful little drone? Well, as the US Air Force seeks to replace it, the US defense giants Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, besides others, are working on a long-range stealthy design concept for emerging of the MQ Next competition. Northrop Grumman has proposed a concept for the SG-2 flying wing for the MQ Next to replace the MQ-9 Reaper drones with the concept of bearing a lot of resemblance to the firm's X-47B unmanned aerial vehicle. According to Northrop, the SG-2, apart from having similar physical features, also has a shared mission control software called the Distributed Autonomy Responsive Control software program, whatever that may be. But it is safe to say that the MQ-9 for now is here to stay and is doing missions that we may not know about all the way around the world. And literally 24-7, all the time, by someone in a hangar flying this aircraft right now. I must admit, UAVs and drones are not my speciality or something that I take a huge fascination into. I should, because I feel like it's going to be the future, but what really drives me uh, into loving aviation is the pilots. and and the raw flying of aircraft. I find that, of course, this is flying an aircraft, but it's it's not the same. You know, you, you love to see, you know, the pilots enjoying their aircraft, being actually in it, experiencing the Gs, um, you know, pulling in that close air support, and you actually feel like you're almost, you know, in some regard, boots on the ground with the troops supplying that close air support, whatever else you're doing. I'm, I'm not a pilot. I'm not saying that I would be doing it. I'm sure they would feel that way. But anyway, drones are here to stay, and hopefully we'll see some uh, new generations of the MQ-9 Reaper in the future. Thank you everyone for joining me today, I hope you enjoyed today's video. As I said before, please make sure you click the little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified of any upcoming content. And if you do want to support my channel, you can check out my Patreon page. Thank you to everyone who has been. All the best, bye bye.